we see these occasional high-profile high cases of business executives who don't seem to be doing the right things. Philip Green is getting all sorts of bad press at the moment. I suspect he's not quite as bad as the press makes out, but that's not the point. The point is perception becomes reality, and that is a, that is a problem. And, and as we start looking at some of the most high-profile failures of recent years, BP, the financial crisis, this is Volkswagen's recent emissions scandal problems, you know, in these cases, we can kind of blame the leadership if you like, but ultimately, in every case, underneath a failure of leadership, there's also been a failure in the systems of management, the ways in which the risk management systems, the performance management systems, and so forth, were all put in place and ultimately found wanting. So we've got a high-profile set of issues, challenges facing the business world. Let me also acknowledge the much more micro issue. Some of you will have seen this slide before. I took it from a, a, an economist at LSE called Richard Layard. He measures human happiness, and he asks people, who are you happiest spending time with? And the bottom line is that the boss comes last. We are much happier with pretty much anybody, and um, probably our dog would be at the top of the list as well, anybody except the boss. We prefer to be alone than with our boss. <laughs> and, um, and again, we mustn't read too much into this sort of data, but it does tell us at least a couple of things. One is that the nature of the, the boss relationship is, by definition, an, an asymmetrical one. The boss has power over us. We don't have power over our boss. We don't choose our boss, at least in the vast majority of companies. We do not choose our boss, but we do choose who our friends are and when we spend our time with our friends. But the, the, the broader point is an obvious one, which is that you know, there is some truth to this. There are some terrific bosses out there. We've all had great bosses. Most of us have also had terrible bosses. And nobody actually wants to be a terrible boss, but the fact is that there's quite a few of them out there. I should probably have put uh, the British version rather than the American version of the, uh, of the office up there, but I think you get the picture. There are all sorts of examples out there of, of satire, of, of humour, directed at the half-witted boss who doesn't know as much about work as the people who he or she is supposed to be leading or managing. And for me, as I say, that the, the problem there is that if we say to ourselves, what's going wrong here? We can't just say a lot of bosses aren't doing a very good job. Well, we've got to, to some degree, say that the system that we've created is at fault. In other words, we have created an organizing world that's complex, that's fast moving, as the lady at the front was saying. It doesn't give us time to actually invest in making things happen over the long term. And as a result, we're all incredibly overworked. We're all trying to do our best, but often failing. Again, I would argue, that we have to take a fresh look at some of our, what I'm going to call, management models, the ways in which we get work done in large organizations uh, in order to try to improve things. So when we talk about innovation in organizations, and most people typically start with things like product innovation and technological innovation, I think we should be spending as much time thinking about the higher order forms of innovation, innovation, if you like, in how we work rather than in what we produce. And in fact, I spent the last 10 years of my career as an academic, as a consultant, as an executive educator, if you like, uh, working on this challenge of management innovation, the idea that we should be trying to, to rethink those basic principles and practices of management. I created an entity which was only a half success called the Management Innovation Lab, an attempt to do exactly that, working with progressive companies to try to come up with new and better ways of working. And I'll share a few thoughts about what that looked like towards the end. So we need to innovate how we manage, how we lead. Management for me is simply getting work done through others. Management and leadership, two sides of the same coin as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we need to invest in trying to come up with new and better ways of working. Why? Well, to solve the problems that I've just been mentioning, both in terms of the overall well-being, engagement and happiness of our employees at the macro, micro level, and to try to solve some of the challenges of legitimacy and purpose and being a force for good in society. So those are bold aims. And obviously, I'm not going to get all the way there, but at least let me open up some of the ways in which businesses, big organizations, need to evolve. One piece of evidence that changes in how we work are vital to improvement. Uh, I took this data from a study done by OECD uh, economists. And the details don't really don't matter, but the, the intuition behind this is, I think, very compelling. It says, essentially, when these economists looked across a whole bunch of sectors, quite a long time ago now, and they looked at which ones had actually invested in new information technology-based systems to improve their productivity, 
what they discovered was that the only ones that got a payoff from that investment were the ones that, in addition, changed their workplace practices. Now, that might seem completely blindingly obvious, but it is quite nice that the data comes out as clearly as that. In other words, you know, just putting, throwing money at technology is never going to solve the problem because all we're going to do is automate uh, a system that was actually designed typically you know, for more industrial type activities and an awful lot of the time, whether it's banks or whatever, our service-based economy is about changing the way we work as much as it is about just cranking up the speed with which we do things. So I want to give you an angle on how I see the, the sort of shifts in competitive advantage over the last period of time and looking forward. So just you know, 20 seconds of, of, of a sort of historical perspective here is quite useful. You know, it's not contested, I don't think, that we move from the industrial age to the information age, but it is worth at least speculating on what that transition looks like, because obviously it's not that we no longer need to do mass production. It's not that we don't need to, to make cars and, and all sorts of other products. It is that the, the basis of competitive advantage, the companies that succeeded in the information age were the ones that were able to do the basics of mass production well, but also, in addition, were able to harness the power of information and knowledge. And the reason that Toyota you know, defeated General Motors and Ford, if you like, during the 60s, 70s and 80s was partly because they had a much more progressive point of view on harnessing the problem-solving skills of their employees than the traditional car manufacturers who did the things the, you know, the old-fashioned way, the worker as a pair of hands. So that transition, as I say, is well understood. But as we sit in this information age, it is worth pondering to ourselves, is, is this, are we going to live in the information age forever? Is it going to carry on you know, for, for good? I mean, it seems unlikely. The word age, almost by definition, suggests a period in history. So I started to grapple with what are some of the, the warning signs, if you like, that the information age, as we know it, might be plateauing. In other words, to what extent will information and knowledge will always be the source of competitive advantage in the future? You know, there's a lot, lot of people out there. Uh, this chap, Ray Kurzweil, is the kind of the, uh, I don't know, the guru, if you like, of this notion that artificial intelligence and big data and analytics, all of these computer-based technologies are growing at such an exponential rate that essentially artificial intelligence will catch up with human intelligence in about 2035. He calls it the singularity. And you can read what he says there. I mean, it's a bit scary as far as I'm concerned, this notion that everything that we do can be done as well by computers. Now, I don't believe that. I suspect most people in the room do not believe it either. But he's got a point, because the point is that, of course, the computer technology, information-based technology and artificial intelligence are almost by definition changing in ways that we can't predict. So undoubtedly, there's some truth to where he's heading, but I don't go the whole way there. And in order to sort of sharpen up my analysis of where I think we're going to end up, the way I ask the question is, you know, what would a world with too much information, too much emphasis on rational knowledge and analysis look like? What would that world look like? Arguably, we already live in a world with too much information. And as I start thinking about, if you like, the dark side or the downside of what we can call the big data movement, for want of a better word, but artificial intelligence is wrapped up in this. We all know about analysis paralysis. We all know that there's a risk that if we allow ourselves to sort of be sucked into this information sort of system, that we will continue to gather data and more and more data until eventually, you know, we think we've got the perfect answer, at which point the world will have moved on and somebody else will have grabbed the opportunities that are associated with it. There's lots of reasons why we've got to be very cautious about this approach. If, have you, if any of you ever read Douglas Adams, as I'm sure many of you did, you'll know that the secret of life, the universe, and everything is 42. The answer is 42. It's a perfect example of the kind of decontextualization and sterile answers that you often get when you ask a computer a question. It's not to say that this is a going in the wrong direction. I'm just saying that there are limits to it. So I've got a, a nuanced view of where the future takes us and I think this has implications for everything we do in business in terms of the types of people we employ, the types of skills that they have, and so forth. And it looks like this. On the one hand, we absolutely need to embrace the information 
revolution and understand better ways of harnessing our own intellectual capacity to make, you know, to, 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 to come to good, to good answers. But in a world where information is ubiquitous, the scarce resource is not information or knowledge, the scarce resource is our own attention, our own capacity to focus on the right things. And in a world where rational, quantitative, reductive knowledge is, is, is at a premium, the risk is that what we do is we actually allow our decisions to be made in a somewhat sterile way based on that rational analysis. So I, I'm actually kind of pushing in the other direction. I think that at least as important as all this uh, computer-based rational stuff on the left, we need to also get the right balance by ensuring that we put a premium on decisive action, being prepared to act sometimes on the basis of imperfect information, and being prepared to somehow harness our emotional conviction, the belief systems that we have. Now, I get into trouble when I say this. A lot of people, particularly those who, you know, who, are, who are sort of immersed in the whole computer artificial intelligence world, you know, they're very, very skeptical of a point of view that says sh that, you, that I want to bring emotional and conviction and intuition back to the decision-making table. And my answer to that, actually, is in a word, is Brexit. I mean, if you remember the decision that the British people made in June, June the 23rd, um, you know, Michael Gove said, we've had enough of experts. We want to make our decisions on the basis of, of essentially emotional and intuitive feel. Now, obviously, I don't think that was necessarily the right decision, but the point is that the power of harnessing people's views on the basis of essentially emotional arguments cannot be underestimated in the workplace. Because obviously what we're trying to do in the workplace is we're trying to come to smart decisions which reflect all of the information available. Some of that can be boiled down to hard, rational, quantitative numbers, and some of it is based on intuition and gut feel. Jeff Bezos at Amazon is famous for saying, look, at, at Amazon we make two different types of decisions. We have the decisions which are based on very, very simple quantitative rational analysis, A-B testing or whatever. Those are the best types of decisions because everyone can agree on the answer. And then he says occasionally we have to make these big leaps forward that no amount of rational data can possibly help us with. Should we launch the Kindle? Should we get into movie making? You can't do analysis in the, in the conventional way on those sort of big decisions. So he says, you know, the biggest ch challenge he faces essentially is to figure out which bucket a decision falls into. So ultimately we need a bit of both. And, and this becomes a big part of my story, as you'll see, which is that, you know, we, we, we absolutely mustn't lose where we are in terms of the, the need to harness information effectively and the need to move into this digital world, as the two previous speakers were saying. But I do worry that sometimes we, we find ourselves being sucked into that way of thinking, and that we actually lose the kind of the humanism and the emotional elements that ultimately are vital for anybody doing an effective job in the business world. So that's my somewhat controversial, provo provocative point of view on the way that the, the world is changing. What I want to do is to map now that idea against a particular view on how we get work done in organizations. You know, one option is, when we're faced with this complex business world, is to fight complexity with complexity. We can create an organization which is as complex as the world in which it operates. I've got a number of friends who work at IBM, perhaps there's some IBM people in the room. Uh, you know, some of them have a four-dimensional matrix structure to operate in. IBM has at least four dimensions on which it is organizing things. Why does it do that? Because it is tackling big, complex client problems, often across multiple sectors, often across multiple countries. IBM has chosen the path of creating a, an organization which is as complex as the world it's serving. I'm not saying that's wrong. It's certainly one path, but it has its downsides. And the downsides are pretty clear, right? I don't need to go through that list. You all recognize the downsides, the limits, or the risks to operating in a complex rule. You don't even have to be a very big organization to face this stuff. At London Business School, we're only 650 people, and I recognize all of these problems. All of these problems, they, the problems kick in usually at around 150 to 200 people. So everything I've said so far, and indeed will say, you know, is really about organizations 
that are above a couple of hundred people. That's when these sort of problems start to materialize. Small companies have a different set of problems. So I'm going to push us the other way. I'm going to suggest that rather than fight complexity with complexity, we need to fight complexity with simplicity. We have to accept that because the world is changing quickly, because client needs are, uh, are evolving, competitors' actions are affecting how we work, we can't possibly build the perfect business plan. What we have to do is to define essentially a set of simple rules, a set of guidelines, and then give much greater autonomy to people to work within those guidelines. And that applies at the level of the company as a whole, and that applies at the level of the, the manager or the supervisor of his or her immediate team. I want to fight complexity with simplicity by essentially, and you've heard this before in various shapes or forms, by taking away many of the procedures and structures that are designed to tell us how to work. Now, I've got a, a little video clip here, uh, and I'm going to ask the folks at the back to kind of, can you run it for 30 seconds or something like that? This is India. This is Hyderabad. Many of you will have traveled in this part of the world. I'm just going to show, as I say, 30 seconds of this, just in case you haven't traveled in this sort of place, you'll see, uh, well, you'll see it's quite chaotic. seconds. We'll just let these people here cross the road. Because I'm sometimes worried that they won't make it. <laughs> they usually get across. <laughs> okay, enough. Just put it on pause, thanks. So, as I say, many of you have visited that part, these parts of the world. Some of you may even have come from those parts of the world. I mean, it's, I was in India just last week, actually, so I, I saw it up close, uh, and, and it is indeed as scary as it looks on the video. Um, it's chaos, but it works, right? In other words, in the course of that video, you see everybody more or less go, go where they want to, how they want to. You know, nobody is knocked over. It probably moves a whole lot quicker than the equivalent interchange in London. But of course, you know, the, the rules are not the rules that we would recognize in terms of traffic lights and one-way streets and markings. These are what we might call emergent rules, the rules that emerge over time through a process of what you might call mutual adjustment by people. And we don't have time to discuss this in any detail, but you could actually lay, lay out the four or five simple rules that people have kind of become accustomed to in the city in order to make the traffic flow freely. And inspired by such examples, we've actually seen various companies, various organizations attempt to create their own version of this in, in Europe. This chap here, Hans Mondermann, most of you have almost certainly never heard of him. He's the originator of the so-called shared space model. And he was inspired by places like India to say, in the West, what we've done is we've created overly complex systems for managing traffic flow. So he said, we've got to get rid of this. We've got to actually push away from order and, and rules. We've got to embrace, if you like, the, uh, the chaos of allowing people to figure things out for themselves. He calls it shared space. The idea is that the cars and the pedestrians and the cyclists share this space. He persuades a bunch of towns in Holland to, to try this out. He actually got them to rip out their traditional traffic lights uh, interchanges and replace them with this model. And sure enough, after a very careful analysis, he was able to show that within a few weeks, people had adjusted very quickly, very easily, to this new way of working with far fewer rules. Emergent order, if you like. Self-organizing is another term you will have heard for the same sort of thing. You know, it's not a panacea. This is not a system that works, for example, if you're partially sighted or if you're disabled. This is not a system that we should use on the motorways where people are traveling at 80 miles an hour and where the downside risk if we, if we get it wrong, is actually very severe. He says that under certain circumstances, getting rid of the rules, the, the, the instructions, if you like, the procedures, can create a better flow of people, greater, if you like, acceptance of that model. So you know where I'm heading with this. This is a metaphor, of course, for organizational life. You know, the traffic lights, 
the one-way systems and the markings are the analogues to our human resource management systems, our budgeting systems, our product development systems. Well-intentioned, well-designed, but ultimately over-engineered systems to create order. In many, many situations, actually what we should be doing is simplifying these things. And, and you will have read about, or indeed you, some of you will even have implemented recently, some of these much simpler methodologies for evaluating people's performance. You know, lots of high-profile companies have said the lengthy, complicated personnel review processes have gone too far. We need to replace them with something simpler. That, for me, is an example of this phenomenon. So I want to now just sort of home in on one particular idea here that is at the heart of everything I'm trying to say. And the thought experiment that motivates this idea is a business reception of the sort that many of you, you know, perhaps you bet you were at one this morning, many of you have been to many, many times. When you're introduced to somebody and you've never met them before, uh, and they say, what do you do for a living? What's your, what's your response? How do you answer that question? You know, the easiest response, the most classical way of doing it is to hand them your business card. And the business card is a very efficient way of providing some basics of information, who you are, the company you work for, and vitally important, the position you have on the, on the org chart. Uh, and some people care a lot about, essentially, how to pigeonhole us in terms of our position in some sort of organizational structure. I had a chance meeting a few years ago with a former, I won't say his name, a former head of a large oil and gas company in this country. Um, and he was at this event, and, and you know, status-wise, he was obviously way above me. I was introduced to him. I'm Julian Birkinshaw. I'm a deputy dean at London Business School. His answer to me, his question to me was, how many deputy deans are there? In other words, <laughs> you know, are you one of 20, or are you one of a small handful? Fortunately, I was only one of two, so it meant that perhaps he wanted to spend you know, five minutes talking to me before he found somebody else to move on to. I'm not sure, but the point is, status is indicated by the business card, and that is useful information, and it's appropriate information, but it's not the whole story. Another way, favoured by my MBA students who are introducing themselves, is essentially to, to read their CV to the person, not read their CV, to talk about their experience, the companies they've worked for, the jobs they've done, the languages they speak, to talk essentially about who they are in terms of the knowledge and expertise they have gained over the years. Obviously, that's a fairly sort of, uh, yeah, it's not, a, it's not a great way of talking to somebody, but it's a great way of conveying certain information. The third, and I think best way, is to talk about what you actually do. Some of you will have heard of a guy called Henry Mintzberg, one of the founders of modern management theory. You know, Henry Mintzberg's great claim to fame, way back in the, late, in the early 70s, was he followed chief executives around to figure out what they actually did on a day-to-day -day basis. And he discovered that what they actually did bore little resemblance to what they said they did or what other people talked about how they did things. So what we do is often a lot more interesting, frankly, than what we know or where we sit on an org chart. And it tells us something, I think, vitally important about who we are. So three different perspectives on organ our position in an organization. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest that each of these perspectives maps against an, an organizing principle that actually is kind of central or important to how the world is changing. So the easy one is this, bureaucracy. You all know what bureaucracy is. Coordination through standardized rules and procedures. In some ways, the whole talk has been anti-bureaucracy, but, but not, not completely you know, in ways which will become clear. In a bureaucracy, the person with the biggest job title calls the shots. Hierarchical authority is a big chunk of the original concept of what we call bureaucracy. So I think we know that, and we don't need to spend any more time on it. It gets more interesting down here. The organizing model in which our knowledge and expertise and experience are privileged, are important, are given due credit, we call that a meritocracy. And if I asked you to raise your hands, I won't. And you said, you know, how many of you believe that your organization should be a meritocracy but rather than a bureaucracy? I think pretty much everybody would, would agree. Meritocracy is a nice word. It sounds as though it basically says that we are evaluating people and using them on their merits. So it's got a very narrow, narrow technical definition in my worldview, which is in a meritocracy, 
we are essentially privileging knowledge over position. And what that means in practical terms is that if you're disagreeing with your boss about the right way of doing something, if you were making a compelling argument that is actually a better argument than that of your boss, then your argument should carry the day. Whereas in a traditional bureaucracy, the boss could say, I don't care what you think. It might be a good argument, but we're doing it my way because I say so. And that's, that's the distinction. So McKinsey and Company, the big management consultancy, you know, one of their principles is an obligation to dissent. Obligation to dissent says exactly that. It says that the junior person is obliged to challenge the view of the senior person if they don't agree with it. Doesn't mean they always win, but they're obliged to challenge. So the meritocracy, professional services firms are meritocracies, universities are meritocracies. There's all sorts of companies out there that absolutely subscribe to this point of view. It's got some downsides. You know, London Business School, if we don't know what to do, we form a committee. And we create that committee, and the committee has, takes hearings, and it writes a report. And you know, almost certainly by the end of that process, virtually nothing changes, if you see what I mean. Six months later, and we've all been in that position, right? Six months later, we've now done the analysis. Everybody feels that they understand the situation better. But in terms of what actually happens, almost certainly nothing happens. And indeed, politics works the same way. Ad hocracy. So what is the organizing model that is sort of the counterpart to an emphasis on the individual in terms of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis? It is an ad hocracy. This is not my word. Uh, I think Warren Bennis originally invented the word, and I think Henry Mintzberg and Robert Waterman and a few others have used it occasionally over the years. I'm kind of re reinventing the word or reusing the word with a very particular focus. And hopefully the focus is, is obvious. What I'm going to say is that in an ad hocracy, by definition, action is privileged over knowledge or position. What does that mean in practical terms? It means that under certain circumstances, perhaps when we don't know exactly what the right, right way of doing forward is, doing something, trying something, experimenting, you know, actually talking to a customer, even creating a prototype of a product and giving it to the customer, doing something is more powerful or more appropriate than thinking about it and discussing it endlessly or falling back on the rules. Now, what does an ad hocracy look like in practice? I'm going to give you a couple of examples, but let me be very clear before we go any further at all that I'm suggesting, of course, that whilst this is the, the exciting place to be, I'm not suggesting for a second that we should completely get rid of these traditional models. To some degree, every organization is going to have some bits of all of these, but the bit that I think is the most difficult and therefore the most important to work on is the ad hocracy. What does ad hocracy look like in practice? You know, a classic example is the original Apple Macintosh. You've heard that story, right? Steve Jobs took a bunch of his brightest engineers, this is what, early 80s or something like that, the late 80s, uh, he took a bunch of his brightest engineers, he took them into a separate building at the far end of the Apple campus, he said, ignore the rules, just do things your way. You are pirates above corporate laws, I think the expression he want, used. I want you to come up with you know, an insanely great product which will, will shape the future of, of personal computing. We know how that story ended. It was a success, but ultimately you know, a success which, which wasn't quite as commercially successful in the short term as he wanted it to be. But the point is simple. The skunk works, the separate group of people off to one side, are essentially an ad hocracy. Of course, they're smart people. Of course, they have some sort of protection from the board. But ultimately, when push comes to shove, doing something in a group like that is more important, as I say, than debating it or falling back on rules. A couple of other examples, just to, just to make sure you, you, you see where I'm going with this. For me, you know, an awful lot of the, sort of the, the contemporary thinking around design thinking and lean startup and stuff is all heading in this direction. Valve is a, is a gaming company, a Seattle-based gaming company. Uh, 350 employees, no managers. Obviously, there's a boss, there's an owner, Gabe Newell. But ultimately, it's an organization which thrives on letting people figure out for themselves what they will do. I took this from the HR manual. Uh, this, you found out by now you were not hired to fill a specific job description. You were hired to constantly be looking around for the most valuable work you could be doing. Now, I realize that that is not a principle that you're going to embrace tomorrow. I mean, appreciate that there are certain aspects of a Californian 
computer gaming company that put them in a very different place than most of the organizations represented in the room. But all I'm trying to do is to sort of stretch your, your thinking in terms of, you know, you hire people and you give them the opportunity to figure out for themselves what to do next. Their job is to create the next game, to join a team of people working on a particular game. That is, in my worldview, a version of adhocracy. Uh, you, many of you will also be familiar with, with this concept of holacracy. Uh, holacracy is very trendy at the moment. To the extent that I'm a little bit worried about it, actually. Uh, I won't go into the details of it. Suffice to say, in this picture, Zappos, which is an Amazon subsidiary, a, a, an online shoe uh, selling company, Tony Shea, the chief executive, they have embraced this concept called holacracy, invented by Brian Robertson, a former software engineer. And holacracy is a, is a flat organizing model. It's a flat organizing model that starts with circles of people, self-organizing teams, working on the issues of importance to them. And they've come up with a very elaborate set of mechanisms for how those self-organizing teams will coordinate with each other. In some ways, they've, they've replaced a vertical bureaucracy with a horizontal bureaucracy. So it's far from flawless. It's far from a panacea. But it's definitely pushing in the direction of saying the starting point for an organizing model is a bunch of self-organizing teams who are customer-facing, who are user-facing, whose job is to tackle and resolve a user's problems or issues. And everything else fits around that rather than us starting from the top of the hierarchy. More prosaically then, uh, agile as a methodology. Most of you in the room will be familiar with it. I don't think I even need to describe it. Uh, this has come out of the world of information technology. It is now starting to find its way into the way that larger organizations work more generally. You know, the essence of Agile is that we have, again, small customer-focused teams or, or problem-focused teams who work through daily stand-up meetings and very, very clear to-do lists in order to accelerate the delivery of a set of projects to a certain set of deadlines. Very, very effective way of getting things done. And again, as I say, it's pr putting a primacy, primacy on action rather than debate, rather than on rules. And this image is just taken from GE, General Electric's website. They've created a methodology they call FastWorks. And the essence of it is, let's take this current thinking about Agile, let's take this current thinking about the so-called lean startup way of accelerating progress, and let us use it with our traditional industrial systems. In other words, what they're, and the reason I'm offering this is, of course, that a lot of you are saying, well, to yourself, you know, I'm not a Californian gaming company. You know, I can't do this. Well, GE, of course, is you know, among the biggest traditional industrial companies on the planet. And what they've done is they've said, we've got to find a way of linking up this new age thinking to our industrial processes to speed them up, to make them more innovative, to make them more engaging. OK, so. I'm running out of time. Let me just make uh, the transition now to a few points on leadership and management. The summary of my ideas here, I mean, the, I'm not going to go through this slide because there's an awful lot of, of material here. The summary of my argument is, is a very simple one, which is that we have these three underlying models of management that have, have shaped the way that we behave for years. Most of us are very comfortable with bureaucracy, because, of course, that has an industrial heritage. Most of us nowadays are actually very comfortable with meritocracy because everything is about making the most of knowledge and people and expertise. The one that is hardest to get our heads around, it's more of a small company model, is the ad hocracy. And the reason it's the most difficult is because whenever we're not sure what to do, whenever times get tough, when we're uncertain about the, the way that we should act, what do we do? We fall back on learned behaviors. And for almost all of us, our falling back is onto bureaucracy or meritocracy. And those are both slow. They're both mechanisms which run the risk of becoming internally focused and actually very, very slow moving. So if one of the imperatives, as I said right at the beginning, for the future of the workplace is about decisive action and greater emotional conviction, what we need to do is to figure out ways of protecting the parts of our organization that need to act in a, in a way that I'm calling ad hocracy. OK, so in summary, before I do my last five minutes on some of the kind of human angles of this, 
Uh, this is how I link the concept of ad hocracy, meritocracy, bureaucracy back to my earlier points around the way that the world is shifting. And of course, you'll see exactly where I'm going with this. The meritocracy is the model for the information age to the extent that there's anything beyond that, more about speed of movement and emotional conviction. We need to embrace this ad hocracy. So my last five minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about what all this means for leadership and management. Gosh, nice little anecdote which I'm going to give a twist is the famous story of how the, the men's world high jump record has evolved over the years. This is, of course, the chart which shows how, over 100 years, the world high jump record has gone up. And as you look at a chart like that, your eyes are immediately drawn to the early 60s. Someone shout out, what's, what's going on there? It's not drugs? Fosbury, right, so exactly. So everyone, myself included, when I first saw that chart, I thought, Fosbury. Turns out we're wrong. It turns out this is not the Fosbury flop. The story is actually more interesting than you realize. Because what's going on is that this period in the early 60s was actually the tail end of the previous method for jumping over the high bar, the, the high jump bar, the straddle jump, as it was called. Two gentlemen, John Thomas, Valerie Brumel, were the masters of the straddle jump. And because they were competing head to head, perhaps they pushed each other, you know, literally to greater heights. And in this period of time, of course, Dick Fosbury was nowhere to be seen. I went back to look at the charts. Here's a picture of him jumping over the bar backwards. I went and dug out his personal best heights as a high jumper using these green dots. And what I discovered, of course, is that he was coming through the ranks, but he was still a long way behind. Everybody was saying to him, Dick, give up on this stupid new way of jumping. It is not helping you. If you jumped the proper way, you'd actually be an elite competitor. But in fact, he said, no, no, I'm going to keep doing it. I believe in it. He was an incredibly stubborn and tenacious guy. And he got a st stroke of luck just before the Olympics, where this chap here, Brumel, who was the world champion, actually broke his leg in a motorbike accident and was never able to jump again. And so that gave Fosbury the window of opportunity that allowed him not just to compete, but to actually win the gold medal at the Olympics. And that's the point, of course, when the world sat up and took notice of this crazy American guy jumping over the bar backwards. And from that point on, of course, lots of people started to use the alternative technique. And for the next few years, the green and the red dots, you know, the new and the old technique, coexisted until at some point. And it was never Fosby, by the way. Fosby never broke the world record. Eventually, the green dot, the Fosby flop, became the de facto normal way of doing things. So why did I tell you this story at this juncture towards the end of my talk? This is, for me, is what ad hocracy is all about. Because we've got these different generations of jumping styles in the high jump. And as we know, disruptive innovations are the ones that come from below. But for that disruptive innovation, the green line to actually work its way through, we needed a crazy guy like Dick Fosbury to disregard everybody's instructions, to continue to push his new way of jumping, despite everybody telling him, actually, this isn't going to work. And ultimately, he prevailed. And of course, these so-called unreasonable people are the people who we remember in business. We know Steve Jobs. We talk about Elon Musk nowadays a great deal. And for me, then, the heart of ad hocracy, then, is that we need to find a way of helping these unreasonable people to be, shall we say, a little bit more reasonable in terms of making sure that what they do isn't just you know, pig-headed and stubborn, but also something which we can harness in some way. So there's, I'm not going to take you through that side. I don't have time. But there's a bunch of, sort of recommendations or advice that we can give to individuals who fancy themselves you know, as a Dick Fosbury, as an Elon Musk, in terms of how they try to get their idea and get it some currency and get it uh, uh, addressed. But what I want to finish with, actually, is, if you like, the leadership lessons for how we make the most of these sorts of people. How do we get the most out of the people who are a little bit maverick, a little bit unreasonable, a little bit not quite your traditional corporate animals? You know, the starting point, of course, is this, this concept we've often talked about called psychological safety. If we want people to experiment with new ways of working, we must avoid, you know, shooting the messenger. We must avoid 
you know, saying that was the stupidest thing you ever did uh, when something doesn't work out because obviously they're never going to try again. So you know, a big chunk of the leader's job in this, in this model that I'm creating here is about, of course, the good old-fashioned virtues of advice and coaching, but much more specifically about being much more tolerant, if you like, of understanding and, 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 and making sense of ideas when they fail. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this Google study. We don't have time. Many of you will be very familiar with it. Suffice to say that Google, despite being a very techie company, has a point of view on leadership, of course, that actually is completely consistent with where I'm going. Um, gosh, I'm not going to talk about the elephant and the rider either because we don't have time. This is, this is a point that I, I, I must get across. Here is the maverick, the crazy guy, trying to change the system. Here is the big system. In order for those crazy people, the ad hocracy based people, to actually make a difference, the most difficult thing is not to find the crazy guys, it's to find the people that are sitting at the interface between the crazy guys and the traditional system. So in every time when I've seen one of these skunk works or one of these ad hocracy based activities work, it was because we had both some interesting crazy people here but also some really smart, you know, well-established people with good track record who were able to translate and make use of these ideas for the mainstream organization. And I don't want you to call them the integrator, the linker, or whatever, uh, but it's not, it's not an organization role that perhaps we have the right name for, but it's actually completely vital. And so we need to find a better way of defining what that linking role looks like because ultimately if the organization is mostly a bureaucracy or a meritocracy and we've got little bits of ad hocracy around the edges it's the way that these gears grind together ultimately that leads to success you're not going to create an organization which is just an ad hocracy you need to find a way of linking the bits and then finally and occasionally we need our leaders of course to be prepared to step up and say look empowering and getting things done through our colleagues is great but there are times when actually the big, bold decisions can only be taken at the top. You know, I have this notion that, that in some ways, you know, the, the process of managing is much easier, either when we're growing easily, when we're, we're, perhaps we're in a deep crisis, in some ways the, the copybook, the playbook of management is easy. The difficult thing is figuring out how to lead in that period of ambiguity where we are somehow between one curve and the next. And I like, of course, Jeff Bezos as one of the best examples out there of a serial business model innovator, somebody who continues to push new ways of working by occasionally saying, this is how we're going to do it. The rest of the time, he's trying to get things done through his people. So this is my final slide. I apologize, I've gone on a little bit longer than I should have. In some ways, this is a summary of the whole story, which is if we are mapping a kind of a world from bureaucracy through meritocracy, to ad hocracy, the way in which the organizational imperatives change should be clear. We're putting a greater emphasis on flexibility and decisiveness in tomorrow's world. What are the implications of that for leadership? Hopefully they're fairly clear. We obviously, some of, we're going to rediscover some old truths in terms of empowering and getting the most out of people. But we've also got to say to ourselves that effective leadership here has an ambidextrous quality. We've got to both be very good at empowering people, but occasionally we've got to be prepared to come back and say, occasionally we think we're going to do things a particular way, and I'm going to set the direction before once again allowing people to figure out the details of how they deliver on it. So apologies, apologies for, for, for accelerating so much in that last five minutes, but I was asked to make sure I had a little bit of time at the end for questions and discussions. So with that, I will finish. Thank you very much.